Good evening, everybody. This is Pat Windrow speaking at the Cable Easel once again with a live show um, devoted to painting and drawing from life. Telephones are open. The number is 348-6800. If you'd like to call, we can talk. If you're wondering what I'm doing or if you'd like to ask questions about how to do what I'm doing, <clears throat> don't hesitate to call. Be glad to talk to you. And. Uh, Today, uh, tonight, it's a scene uh, um, in Lloyd Harbor. It's the Marshall Field III estate, the view from the estate. Sometime during the program, we'll show you a picture of the house, which is really astonishing. I mean, it's one of those amazing Long Island estates that are visible to the public only when they become accessible to the public. And this place was made accessible to the public in about 1964 and uh, it's now a park in which you can visit and see it. But anyway, this is the scene. This is the view from the estate. And um, of course, it's over Long Island Sound because it's on the North Shore. Uh, the day that this was um, uh, photographed, it was hazy. However, um, because uh, art and paint are what they are, I will show you how you can overcome the fact that Connecticut disappeared during the haze and put it in myself because I've painted it often enough now for the past 30 years to know exactly what the coastline look like, looks like. So I'm starting on a blank canvas. As with anything in existence, you need a plan. And the plan is to lay this out. This is a, a sort of a semi-aerial view whereby the horizon line is quite high and the first thing that you do because you live on the planet where there's a horizon is to put the horizon line in and then you know where you're going. From there, from there, it should be fairly simple. This is obviously a one line composition, won't stay that way, but that's how you start out. Sky and land. Something happens down here, nothing is happening up here on this particular composition. But, as I said, the elusive and sometimes invisible co Connecticut coastline is going to be sketched in here to give you some idea, some idea of where we are. Well, it's a quite an extraordinary, very pastoral, sort of semi-English looking scene. We've seen photographs of England this way, except that the atmosphere here is very definitely Long Island. Now, and the, uh, the uh, uh, watery area is interrupted by a number of one interesting shapes. And one of them, obviously, is a tree, uh, a treed island in this uh, little cove, which uh, undoubtedly belonged to the Marshall Field Estate. And so be it with the very rich and famous. They have these uh, remarkable places. This little cove uh, doubtlessly has a name. Uh, it's called Comset Park, C-A-U-M-S-E-T-T, -T, which is the name that Marshall Field, the grandson of Marshall Field, gave to the place. It's the Indian name for a place by the hard rock. Uh, so um, there's always something always very romantic about being able to place uh, the reason for a name such as this. And uh, when you tap into the, uh, into the Indian history of the area, I think it makes it even, even better. Here is the land mass that is uh, rising to the right, and it is remaining just underneath the coastline and the waterline on the horizon, which tells you how high the aerial view is. Uh, this place obviously rises uh, from the water up uh, a rather steep set of hills uh, for this uh, really breathtaking view of Long Island Sound and beyond and whatever is north. So. <clears throat> 
the choosing of this place is not only because Channel 1 now on Long Island has been going farther and farther afield than it did before, but because it's also accessible to the public and you may in fact go and see this place. Uh, there are no public facilities there and um, uh, you go strictly with a, with a walking in mind and uh, an observational tour is quite wonderful just by itself. So Comset Park in Lloyd Harbor, uh, certainly if you want to go and check me out and see how authentic my rendering of this uh, state is, then by all means do it. Um, this is the laying out that takes place whenever I do a landscape. It must be placed. Uh, I find a gr great fault with the programs that want you to start applying paint to canvas immediately and so I avoid that at all costs and I always draw it first assuming and, and I hope but not uh, wrongfully that the people who want to paint uh, are going to have some no knowledge of drawing before they start doing the can the paint on canvas thing so here is the general uh, layout of these color masses I'm going to uh, we have one hour in which to do this and, and besides answer phone calls and maybe have conversations so I'm going to uh, be working as quickly as possible, not to be tricky and not to show how fast I can paint because I don't think that that's ever the point. The point is that this is an instructional program and I'm going to attempt to uh, give you as much information I can, as I can about doing this kind of a project. Uh, were we not on video uh, tape and were I uh, in the field, as it were, I would be sitting up on a hill in about the same thing, certainly not on a stool, but sitting on the grass and looking at what I'm uh, looking at my subject matter. And uh, that's the, uh, that, in my opinion, is the most rewarding and also the most informative way of working. I do not think that uh, the imagination of the human mind or the retention of the human memory can be so um, foolproof uh, that you would have to be able to, that you could do something uh, simply by memory. Um, that's why I keep stressing the business of, of um, working from life. I'm mixing on the canvas, as I've said a number of times before, when you schlep your materials out into the field, you try to keep it at a minimum for weight and for inconvenience, and therefore sometimes you don't even need a pallet um, when you're out there in the field. I have oft times gone without a pallet and used the, um, the uh, part that I'm using now and then find some corner at the bottom of the painting, mix my colors down there and at the end simply blend them in, take them off and blend them all in and uh, uh, dispense entirely with the need to carry a pallet and then with the need to carry a pallet full of wet paint back up the hill and across the parking lot and down the road to the car. Or even uh, if you're walking, it's still just entirely too much to carry. So here I'm laying in with a palette knife and I talk about my supplies many times and where I get them and how much I pay for them because there's no question that oil painting does in fact entail a certain amount of expense or, or very much worth it but also expense that can be um, tempered and be made much more sensible because you do not have to fall for the uh, the tricks of buying all these uh, named uh, television show named supplies that are three times more expensive than the best brands on the market and so uh, I talk about my supplies uh, quite often. This is the quickest way that I know that I can uh, put in a large area of paint. The palette knife is wonderful. This little um, uh, tool that I just used here that you see is made of plastic. It costs 89 cents, 89 whole cents, as opposed to $8 or $20 for the steel uh, palette knife, which of course is very, is very fancy and so on. Here it is. Um, it's, got a, it's got a wonderful maple handle. But if you can use something that costs uh, one-tenth of that, then in my opinion, it is definitely worth being told about. So I'm telling you about these palette knives, and they come in many sizes, and they're perfectly adequate, especially if people are just beginning and have to watch the amount of money that it costs to begin a project such as painting. Well, as I uh, said earlier, because it was cloudy and hazy and that you couldn't really see that coastline, 
Um, I'm going to put it in because I know it was there, even though the atmosphere descended upon it and made it virtually invisible. But a slight, uh, a slight deeper tone than what the sky. Well, that's much too dark. Let's make it even paler than that and uh, make it as mysterious as it is when it is barely there uh, in real life. So, oops, still too dark. It's amazing how, um, how uh, your color sense changes when you're on a dark palette and then you bring it up against your um, light sky. So the insinuation of a, of a coastline is what I'm after here. Just, just, barely, just barely whispering that there's a coastline out there. And we all live on the island and know perfectly well that that coastline can disappear in one moment and 15 minutes later it's back again uh, because of the rising of the, uh, of the mists and the clouds and these wondrous things that take place in, in our landscape. Uh, as, uh, as my audience sometimes knows, I have moved to Virginia and every month I come back and get my Long Island fix and uh, find myself um, in admiration, as usual, of the uh, Long Island landscape. Witness uh, the one that we're looking at right now. Uh, it's almost uh, irresistible to see such a, a wonderful looking place. The mountains are wonderful and these are equally as wonderful, only in a different way. So here we have the coastline of Long Island, invisible on our monitor, but uh, certainly um, uh, perfectly acceptable to put it in. Uh, the water is uh, most of the time darker than the sky, uh, doubtlessly because of its depth or for other reasons that the uh, uh, the atmosphere and the light plays on water. It is it is darker than uh, th usually um, on a summer day. It's always darker than the sky because the sky is uh, so full of uh, refracted light. It's just wonderful, wonderful. The, the summer the summer is wonderful for painters. Uh, it um, I'm not fond of the very hot weather, but it certainly makes for uh, wonderful color schemes and lighting effects on, uh, on all the greenery and so on. So in the summertime, um, I paint a great deal out of doors. I, I find a shady tree, of course, and be sure to, I'm sure to wear a hat and find a place where it is a little bit breezy. But um, the summertime is the time for painting landscapes. I'm hoping that the people who are watching here have gone, in fact, taken the plunge somewhat and gone out and tried to capture some of, it, the, uh, some of the wonderful scenes that take place when uh, the land is gentle. Uh, uh, as opposed to what it is this evening. Apparently there's some uh, rather heavy blow headed this way and um, that uh, will more than likely make for some interesting landscape uh, studies later on. Um, the, uh, the color that I have put on the uh, Connecticut coastline there is so faint that I think it's doing exactly what we wanted to do it. We wanted it to be as faint enough so that maybe it didn't seem to be there at all. And um, the, uh, the putting in of the background of the water it can be almost uh, like a cutout. There is no uh, surface disturbance on that water. There is nothing but a clear field of blue, which is uh, if that's the way you see it, that's the way you'd put it in. You would not start uh, inventing things on the surface of the water because it is really, in this composition, merely a background for what is happening in front of it. Um, the, the greenery. Let's, uh, t uh, as you know, and I've said before, I do not use any kind of green that comes out of a tube except something called, by the Grumbacher people, called sap green. It seems to be the least harsh and the least uh, unnatural. Most of the greens that come out of tubes are genuinely unnatural as far as nature is concerned. You simply do not find those uh, harsh and uh, unfortunate greens. Most greens are, are lowered in value by purples and blues and sometimes by oranges, uh, orange tones, not oranges, orange tones. And so when I, when I say mix your own greens, of course I, I mean it, uh, but you are uh, allowed to use sap green once in a while. Uh, there's always a lovely color variation in these, in these great thick uh, places where the uh, glades and the, uh, the dells are, uh, especially near the water. Something happens to uh, uh, leafy places down near the water that makes them uh, really uh, uh, so vibrant in color. They pick up a lot of the mists and a lot of the wetness that comes from being near the water and of course the shadows are extremely deep. And when you do a little island like this, it's not just a, it's not just a, uh, a, d a dark green thing out there. It's got its, uh, it's got its little 
shady places and so on. And also I see that it's got peeking through it some of the water behind. So we'll just make sure to make sure to put that in and that you know I observed that there was uh, little blue places that where the, where the trees are not that thick. So um, let me get some more white. And uh, don't forget, if you have anything that you would like to talk about, I'm right here. This is the one, one time in the month of um, August where I can talk to you. The rest of the time I'm on tape. And um, I'm sure that by now any, anybody who's been watching the program for enough time knows that, that uh, Tuesday is the night that I'm here. So, uh, proceeding on with this lovely little island, which is uh, sort of really very dark and I'm going to introduce a little ultramarine and some black in there to get that dark dark space where obviously there is a very big tree casting very dark shadows underneath it and that gives some character to it and it's dark underneath. Okay, I've gotten the signal that somebody's on the phone. Hello there, tell me your name please. Hi, my name is Cynthia. Yes, Cynthia. Um, I just wanted to say first of all that I've been watching your show for a little bit. I, I'm new to the area and I, I just wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, and even though I don't paint because I'm, I'm hopeless at it, I do do a lot of pen and ink. And um, what That's I good. Oh, well, I'm sorry. What I noticed what you said, especially in, in this segment, was that you do lay out your drawings so that you've got a, a, a template to follow. What is it that you use to do the black line drawing that you first start off with? Okay, I'll show you. It's nothing more than this nice, and then this nice flexible brush that is tinted. It's turpentine with a tint of anything, anything dark. And it's this wonderful, very flexible brush. I'll show you. See how flexible it is? It's like it, um, it reacts very nicely to line and makes a very fine line. And it's, uh, it's what I say, it's tinted turpentine. Oh, because I was wondering, I didn't think it would be paint. It doesn't seem to bleed into your original... No, it's very, uh, there's virtually hardly any color on it at all. Well, that's wonderful. I've turned it into a sort of an ink. Well, I appreciate that. I don't know if I'll ever take up oil painting, but I just certainly enjoy your show so much. Thank you so much for calling. You're welcome. Good. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, yeah. So, here we are. We've now, we've now, while we were speaking to Cynthia, I believe, uh, Cynthia was her name, uh, we walked across this little uh, spit of land here uh, and are, are beginning to, I'm beginning to work on the foliage of the next part. Can you imagine life living in a place that looks like this and being able to see this every day? It's an extraordinary uh, uh, planet that we live on, I think. And um, maybe that's why I uh, became a painter, because I'm so conscious of the, um, of the visuals that are around me. I think I always was. And um, uh, there are some paintings that I did when I was seven, and they are landscapes uh, with flowers and things. And so I have not moved too far away from that time a long while ago when I was a wee child and painting. Um, uh, that was in Europe, and I painted uh, scenes that t t today I realize are um, very much like France. And so we paint our environment, and uh, that's what I'm trying to tell uh, the viewers here, that one of the more fun things to do is to do just that. Paint your environment and place, paint the place in which you live, and I think you'll learn a great deal about it in so doing. Uh, you learn to observe times of day and conditions of uh, the air and uh, also um, what uh, we do as a people here. Uh, sometimes I find myself painting places that are less than picturesque just because I'm kind of interested to see what people do. I painted a, uh, a scene with um, an abandoned car once uh, right next to a beautiful cornfield and I painted the abandoned car and I learned a great deal the day that I did that about, about uh, what uh, we humans do here. So being a painter is not just putting things down in the way of a picture but it's also probably being an observer of our behavior. Uh, questionable sometimes but nevertheless uh, 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 ever interesting. Uh, here, as you can see, I put the dark green here for a background so that this clump of trees that is in front of it will have a contrast uh, the minute I put that in. Uh, I don't want to have any of these things think that I'm doing this in a tricky way. I want you to be able to follow just about uh, all the moves that I make to get the effects that I do. But this, these dark colors that I put here uh, are 
in the realm of layer painting. I put in a layer of color and then I overlay it with another one. And that is very much the technique that I talk about uh, most of the time. Oh, good, another call. Hello there, tell me who you are, please. Hello? Yes, this mm -hmm. is Grace. Yes, Grace. Uh-huh. I'm so thrilled to be looking at you and listening to you. <laughs> uh, you painted a mural for my cousin Joan in Woodbury over 30 years ago. <laughs> was, do you remember Joan and West Rocky? Well, you bet I remember. Yeah. and it was so magnificent. Every time I go there, I'd say to Joan, and she told me who you were, but uh, I never could find your name in the book. Well, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me your name again. I'm Grace Gigerick. Yes, and I Grace. live in Kings Park. Good. Uh, well, and, and Joan and Wes moved to Scottsdale, Arizona about 17 years ago. Yes. But that mural was so magnificent. It was about early New York, uh, the uh, uh, harbor. Yes, yes, I do remember. Yes. Yes, I remember. Beautiful. I was working hand in hand with a, with a decorator at the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, how, what, how lo what a lovely call this is. Yes, yes, I was so thrilled. I must tell Joan I got to talk to you. Please, call her up in Scottsdale and pay the bill. <laughs> good. And good luck to you, and I love your shows. They're just wonderful. Thank you, Grace, very much. All right. Call again. Thank you for talking to me. Thanks bye -bye for calling. Bye-bye. Ah, oh, yes, well, I did a mural in the uh, in the bank in uh, East Setauket. The Marine Midland Bank in East Setauket has a mural of mine that is dated 1954, and I tell everybody that I painted it when I was five. So uh, when that lady says that it's a mural I painted 30 years ago, it's the absolute truth, but I was only one when I painted it. No, that's not so. Anyway, um, uh, I don't care. Uh, there's one thing that I'm sure that I can never do anything about, and that is time flying. Uh, and I can't, the least I can do about it is here on this program. Time flies on this program unmercifully. But we cope with that. Now, uh, the next layer that is going to come forward is the pond, uh, which may or may not be called Comset Pond, or it may have a name, but uh, I don't know it. And if anybody does know it, they can jolly well call me up and tell me about it. But in the meantime, once again, I'm going to mix the blue right on the canvas. And the pond appears to be somewhat paler than the, uh, than the uh, no it isn't, it's about the same as the sound color beyond, that I did beyond. Too much blue, forget, uh, forget that, we gotta now put some more white on there. Uh, proportions are interesting. Sometimes, uh, no matter how, how smart you think you are, your proportions can sometimes be really cockeyed. Anyway, I'm mixing it on the canvas just as I did the sky. Uh, uh, obviating the need for a for a palette, and um, uh, it's also a, a wonderful way of uh, the the, uh, the palette knife is a is a quick way of putting in uh, what I would say is um, is almost uninterrupted colors or planes of color. Uh, when you're dealing with landscape, there's a lot in the landscape that is just planes of color. And here's one with the water lapping up against this uh, shoreline of this little promontory that sticks out. And then uh, along the, the spit, and I'll bet you that the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of old Mr. Marshall Field uh, ran across that spit uh, for many, many summers past. And probably uh, until it became public access, it probably had little Marshall Fields running all over these um, fields, may as well say it. Uh, the, uh, these, these places with heritage like that conjure up all sorts of uh, things in my mind. Uh, I, I was never a writer, but I certainly do make up stories. Um, the, um, the wonder about uh, painting your environment and where you live and not waiting until you get to Venice or until you get to to uh, uh, Shanghai is that you can go back the next day uh, when the sun or the light is somewhat the same and then you can set yourself up in the same place you know what to expect and you can brush up on whatever it is that you did the day before and that makes for what I call refined paintings and I don't mean by that paintings with manners I mean paintings that have been refined from a rough stage to a studied stage and one that has uh, got some craftsmanship and some technique uh, that has been worked at 
uh, uh, yeah, oh hi, let me take that call. Hello there. Hello. Yeah. My name is Dawn, and right now I'm working on a project, and I can't seem to get my, it, it's supposed to be a sunset in the background, and I'm, I blend blues and pinks together, but it doesn't look like a true sunset in the background. How can I get that, that perfect effect? Are you working from a sunset? Well, I'm working from a picture of a sunset. Ah, that's a no-no. Okay. That's, that's a no-no. And uh, because the camera is not generous, the camera is, is, is less generous than your eyes are. And uh, Dawn, um, I think that if you, uh, if you would set yourself up in front of a genuine sunset, and you don't have to work with paint, but if you were to set yourself in front of a sunset with a pad and a pencil and write notes, uh, and areas such as uh, orange moby pink over here and brilliant orange over here and pale pink on the outside I think that you would get a great deal more out of it and you would get more of an effect if you would work from a sunset rather than from a picture okay I'll try that I really think so um, and, I, and if you do that uh, I wish you'd call and tell me what your experience was and then then if it's a total failure uh, you can you can tell me uh, that was lousy advice, or you can say that it was good and that you're going to be able to decipher what you're doing. Okay. The only thing, uh, the problem is a, a true sunset has a lot of yellows and oranges in it, and I wanted the pinkish blue effect in the background. Well, wait for the orange s sunset. Okay. Wait for it. I'll give it a shot. Well, well, do you live near where you see the sunset all the time? Well, I go over to Robert Moses, so... I, I'm sure I can catch that effect one day or another. I'm I'll sure you... i out. I never thought about, you know, just sitting there and, and watching it myself. I always have gone by portraits. So I'll well, Dawn, I, I think I've explained this to you before. Maybe you didn't hear me, but copying a picture is doing the following. You are copying the second dimension... You are copying the second dimension onto the second dimension. There is no depth to that. Right, I understand. What you have to do is to take the third dimension, which is in the round, and transfer it to the second dimension. Okay. You sound to me like you'd be able to do it. I think I can. <laughs> and by all means do it, and you will have the best time sitting in front of that sunset. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Good luck, Dawn. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there we have now. You see what happened while I was uh, talking sunsets. I have put the so-called shadow from this little, from the little island and the little sand spit, or the little spit across here, uh, and it's indistinct. The shadow that is being cast on this water is not a mirror image, uh, far from it. it. But it's quite deep, and it's uh, it's quite intense, and it's got a touch of purple, a touch of sienna, uh, some ultramarine blue, and in general a rather nice indis indistinct set of dark colors. Um, what you try to do with water is to make it glisten, shine, or look totally transparent. Here what we're trying to do is to make it look as ethereal as it seems to be from this elevated view. An elevated view of the water is a rare thing because you're usually either in an airplane or you're or on the top floor of a house and uh, and it's not the same as being in the out of doors looking at it. So I'm hoping that this aerial view uh, and the water is as uh, glistening and shiny as it should be. Probably if I were to introduce a little bit of paler blue down at the bottom here, it might give a sort of an iridescence. Let me just try that and see whether or not uh, that will work, because I, 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 I'm sort of missing the idea that there is a, a, a luminescence about it. And uh, when you're dealing with water, you ought to try and get the character of the water as well as the color. Uh, and when it's a luminescent color, of course, the, the early American painters, such as Frederick Church, and uh, the, um, uh, the, in the incredible uh, landscape painters, uh, Asher B. Durand, and all these people of the Hudson River School, they had water that was able to simply glow and glisten. It was magical. And um, naturally, landscape painters always have their favorites. And my favorites are the American School of Painting uh, at the uh, middle of the last century. That to me is absolutely the best time of landscape painting. Uh, the landscape painters that came from Europe were great, but they did not have what I call the, uh, the totally exciting discovery period of painting that took place here with the landscape painters. Um, when Bierstadt came to America, he must have gone totally bananas when he saw the size of the place. And that's why Bierstadt's paintings of the American landscape are so remarkable because he was 
enamored of them. Another call. Good. Hello there. Tell me who you are, please. Hello? 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 Yes. I can hear you. Um. I think we lost a very small voice. Well, I can barely hear you. But thanks for calling anyway. Bye. <laughs> well, um, I'm sure that it's probably intimidating for a, a wee one, and uh, I'm glad that she made the attempt. That was um, that was probably braver than I can imagine. Um, I was talking about the European painters, and the European painters were, were remarkable, but something happened when painters came over here and saw this American landscape. Uh, the size must have sent them uh, completely reeling, uh, because Europe, uh, as we know, is a very crowded place. I mean, it's a big place, but, it's, uh, but for the most part, it is crowded compared to us. And we have these expanses of space here, which which made the American landscape painting uh, come into enormous um, bloom in the middle of the last century. In the, uh, from the 1830s on to the turn of the century, the landscape painting that came out of America. And of course, it's all available in the books in your library, so if anybody is really interested in landscape painting, uh, thumbing through one of those books, I'm sure it's probably a lot more uh, interesting and far more rewarding, I think, than probably um, uh, Ladies Home Journal. I mean, I don't mind Ladies Home Journal, but I, I sure do love to stroll through the art books. And uh, perhaps you might find the same thing. I'm going to take a very, very short break and be back in a moment. Don't go too far away. We are now. That wasn't too bad. I hope you uh, were able to not lose your train of thought. Uh, but I'm not on such a complicated uh, mission here. It is a mission to get my audience to play with me with observation. Observation is probably one of the more interesting things that we uh, don't do as often as we might. I'm afraid that everything is given to us rather, uh, rather benignly by this amazing medium called television. We're given all the visuals we could ever hope for, and therefore we don't, I think, tap into the resources that we have to observe things ourselves. And maybe that's my, uh, that's one of the uh, reasons for this program, and maybe it's one of the reasons that I took up painting and I've stayed with it for low these many years. Um, I'd, be love, I'd love to talk to anybody who has some feeling about, um, about painting in general, and the number is 348-6800, so call, I'm here now, and I will not be here until the end of September. So this is the time, the last Tuesday in, in August is when I'm here, and uh, this is when we can have ourselves a meeting. Um, here is the, uh, here's the sort of evergreen arrangement here against uh, the background of the pond, and painting the, um, painting the pond in first is obvious. Uh, you don't paint around 
uh, the uh, evergreen, you would uh, apply it as an overlay on the background. I use quick drying white, which is put out by the Grumbacher people, and um, it dries uh, quickly enough for the paint to set so that it does not uh, pick up color when I apply over it later. Uh, it's, um, it's called MG's Quick Drying White and I think that this demonstration can show you that I have not been painting here long this evening and that paint is already fairly well set and very cooperative. I can, I can actually um, paint over where I went a few moments ago such as this pale color of this bush against the dark tree is, um, is uh, because of the uh, way the paint behaves. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit further down with this darkness because um, that's going to be a background for a uh, part of my snow fence. There is a snow fence that is not very visible because it's so far away but there are close-ups and if I were out there in person in this meadow I would be able to look very very closely and probably see it but there are certain limitations to this electronic um, uh, medium and uh, the limitations are that the focus is constant rather than uh, be pliable uh, which would happen when you, if I'm if you were there. So uh, the um, the, the the marriage of green and blue has always been very seductive. I mean, the, uh, there isn't a home decorator that doesn't know that the minute you put green and blue together, you've got yourself a client. And um, witness this kind of a composition whereby the green and the blue are closely related. Uh, uh, you know, they play with each other, they blend in and out. And it's, um, it's, almost, uh, it's almost foolproof. These kind of paintings almost paint themselves. Not really, but they come pretty close. Uh, okay, another call. Hello there, tell me Hi, who Pat. you are. My name is Elaine. I'm just sitting here watching you and I am just completely amazed at how you could make such a beautiful painting out of nothing. <laughs> but I'll tell you the real reason I call. As many times, I, I, I watch you as often as I can, but uh, many times you say that what you do is just um, Oh, a lesson, actually. And then you take these to your studio and you refine them. Right. Will there ever be a time when you will do a painting such as the one you're doing now and perhaps refine that one so that we can see just what you do? Of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, we had an event here a few years ago called Art for Open Lands in mm -hmm. which some of these paintings were for sale. And mm -hmm. those paintings had been taken back them. to my studio and uh -huh. refined and they were here on sale. Uh -huh. But uh, I don't know when that event is going to take place again, but I will certainly... Um, did you say Elaine was your name? Elaine, yeah. Yeah, good. I think that maybe I'll plan to do that at the end of September. I'll take some of these pieces um, that I have worked on and that, that were sort of rough uh, when the time, when, you know, when they were over, and I'll bring them back in and show you how I got them to the point where I was happy enough to frame them. I would love to see it. Good, I fine. I enjoy your work so much. Keep going. Thanks for calling, Elaine. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I love that word amazed at. When, when people say they're amazed at what I do, it makes me feel really, really as though this is worth the effort that it goes into it. Um, the effort is, is only my years of experience at the easel. I paint an average of uh, six hours a day, just like most people go to a job. Uh, I paint six hours. At least I try to. Sometimes it can, with luck, uh, turn into uh, seven or eight hours. But I do have a life uh, besides painting, and so I have to actually get away from the easel. And here's the shadow underneath this uh, clump of trees here that is apparently another, another uh, little, um, well, uh, uh, island or spit of land out into this uh, cove. And I will show you where that, um, if you stay on here, I will show you where that particular uh, greenery uh, begins to um, separate itself from the shadow and by that I've prepared the shadow and I'm just going to put this paler greenery up against it and that'll tell you that that's where that tree ends. Um, the close-up will show you but that's where that tree ends there and the shadow begins below it. Uh, all of these things have to make sense and I just wanted you to know that when that shadow underneath there looks so dark that it does in fact have a separation uh, with color. Uh, in the foreground, just behind this fence, I'm going to prepare this once again, are some bushes that are, uh, that are um, down by the waterside. And um, 
the snow fence is going to probably be the, uh, the probably the most tedious of the painting, but very much worth the effort. Uh, anything that is a repetition, if you don't set your mind to it, is a tedious chore. Uh, I suppose you could apply that to many things that one does in the name of housework. However, uh, the details with painting, as opposed to the details of stacking dishes every night, uh, the painting remains, the dishes don't. And so I will take painting uh, over and above all the other activities that I'm talking about. Uh, here is this um, the little, little sort of little green green place and uh, over on the um, right side of this picture is um, a part of this meadow that has probably suffered from the summer drought and its grass has lost its um, greenness and it's become well what you might say uh, well, it's become certainly not blue like I've got going here. It's become uh, faded and um, weedy. Uh, so I'm going to use um, a paint called Flesh Tone, which is a stupid name for a color because it's nowhere near Flesh Tone, but it's a lovely pinkish color. Oh, good, there's another call. Hello there, tell me your name. Uh, this is Dolores, Miss Winslow, and I really enjoy your work. You make everything look so easy. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, you know, my question is that I notice you paint in rows, and I'm wondering how you feel about painting all over the canvas. Well, um, uh, uh, Dolores, I, I, um, I, try to, I try to address that uh, every now and again, and, and you probably missed it the few times that I have addressed it. Um, this uh, oil painting is painting in layers. You call it rows, you call it rows, but it is going from the farthest point in the background towards the foreground. Right. And in order to do that, you have to paint an overlays. Uh, did you notice when I did this and then I overlaid the green on top of it? Right. Well, that's, uh, you call it rows. Actually, what it is is overlays. I see. Because you would not paint around this tree. Right. So, uh, it's a technique of mine which may or may not be uh, as valid as I think it ought to be, but it also is one that has worked for me very well, and I think okay. it yeah. enables me to go out and work in the field very rapidly. I see. Well, you do beautiful work, really. I admire it, and I enjoy watching you. Are you using a medium right now? Uh, I'm using no medium. I'm using something that is a built-in medium in Grumbacher's product called MG Quick Drying White. MG Quick Drying White. Yes, it's MG stands for M. Grumbacher. Yes. And it's called Foundation White. I see. It's as white as you'd ever want it. It also dries. You can get a lot of texture with it. It comes very thick and um, it will dry within a matter of um, minutes, sometimes hours at the very most. Well, I'm going to try that. As opposed to days. I see. Oh, do try it. You will, will find yourself absolutely delighted. I wish I could do the same as you. <laughs> That's beautiful. You can. Thank you very much for talking. To Thanks me. for calling, Dolores. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, it is never my intention to make it look like it is that easy, but apparently that happens. And I guess I ought to stress everyone now and again that it's not easy. And that, um, that I have been painting for such a long time, and I've been doing these demonstrations for such a long time. I'm almost in my twelfth year now, meaning that I've been showing how to do this for a very long time. So maybe um, my, it looks facile, and maybe it, I, I make it look easy, but I don't believe that I could really honestly say that it is easy. What is probably difficult is the continuous jabber that I have to do uh, in, in place of having dead air. And so uh, applying the paint uh, is, um, is, this is obviously my technique and, I, and I'm throwing it out for whatever it's worth to the people who would like to, uh, to sort of use it, but it's, uh, it has worked, the, uh, the, uh, the layering. It's, a, it's an old classic style. It's got nothing to do with my inventing anything. It's been done for years and years and years. All right, here is this greenish field over here that uh, apparently has not been uh, uh, affected by the drought. And it's um, lying uh, as, part of the, uh, as part of the background for the snow fence. And um, I'm putting it on with a brush because it doesn't have very much going for it. There's almost nothing happening in this field. The grass has just gotten somewhat darker as it uh, goes into the little ravine so I'll sort of I'll sort of insinuate that 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 part of the grass is somewhat darker because the land probably dips down there and then 
Uh, the, um, the tree on the side is obvious. Uh, I'm going to do it exactly the same as the other one. But what I'm going to do is to get to the snow fence before time uh, goes too far and before, uh, you know, it, I have talked about the snow fence and there's no snow fence at all. Uh, so it makes it an incomplete uh, lecture. Uh, here is the background um, that I've prepared for the introduction of this snow fence, which obviously uh, is needed because of this huge estate. And uh, when, the, uh, when the winter winds do bring the snow, I'm sure that there must be very, very high drifts. And that's why it's there. I'm not sure that aesthetically it's uh, the most beautiful thing in the world, but it may also keep the public out of the area where the pond is. But it's part of the landscape. And, that's what it, that, and it's going to go in for that very reason. Um, I'm going to just do it interpretively, and then as I think it was Elaine who wanted me to show my refined uh, or my, my worked on paintings sometime, I'm going to tell you right now that this snow fence uh, is going to be put in very, um, very roughly. Uh, I'm not using red out of the tube, I'm using a sort of a sienna. And I'm going to attempt to give me give myself a guideline. This fence is going to have something of a nice of a, of a nice curl to it, and I'm going to give myself a guideline. And I'm leaning on the on the canvas with this marvelous new brush of mine. I have to admit that I paid something for this brush. This is an eight dollar brush, and you kind of bite the bullet when that happens. But you have to have it. It's a wonderful tool, and it's uh, I couldn't do this without it. And here is the tedium uh, of doing something which is a repetitious, but it is also uh, important for the com composition. First thing one does is put on the glasses. And I'll show you that you can, in fact, overlay this over the painting. And the, the trick is to try to get it as even as possible. This uh, ability to do this probably comes from the fact that I raised my son alone and paid for all of that by being a letterer. I was a calligrapher. So I know how to handle a brush and I know how to do straight lines when I need to and uh, and I know how it how you have to buckle down and do the nasty nitty-gritty when you want to get a certain effect uh, you have to admit that uh, watching me do this is hardly the most inspiring uh, thing you can think of but I'm going to get this paint a little bit uh, thinner and so that I don't have that there that's better now you can see because uh, because uh, uh, Peter Kohler, this director, knows exactly when to come in really close to show what I'm doing, uh, that these lines can be, in fact, uh, liquid enough so that, they, so that they pass by, uh, I mean, pass over the background that I set up with this sort of pale tone. And here is the way one would continue to do this. And then whatever you see down here is going to be covered up by the grasses that are in front of it, uh, hence the layered thing of painting. So, uh, as, as long as, uh, I don't know how much time we have, maybe somebody will sort of whisper uh, how many minutes are left, but um, this is how you do it. You simply go ahead and you do it. Uh, you, I can't say that it's the greatest fun in the world, but you know what is fun? When you manage to do it and it come, it, you pull it off and it does in fact look like what you want it to look like, that's when the tedium pays off. So uh, that is, by the way, the most well-prepared, well-preserved snow fence I've ever seen. There isn't one of them that's leaning out of, uh, out of line. Uh, usually, some sections of them have fallen over to the side. So anyway, let me show you that with that fence there, as I'll continue it later, there is, a, there is a, uh, some weeds that have grown up over and are hanging over that fence. Uh, that, to me, is one of the fun things. To, um, to do. So this green that is hanging over, uh, has climbed up over this fence, it comes on after the fence is done. Uh, call. Okay, let me take the call. Hello there, tell me who you are, please. Yes, my name is Enid. Yes, Enid. Yes. Uh, not only are you creative with your brush and paint, but also with the uh, with your manner of speech. <laughs> and I was just wondering what your educational background is. Well, uh, I'm a high school dropout, uh, but I should, I should elaborate on that by saying that I got here from Europe when I was 16 and I had gone through everything that high school had to offer uh, because I had gone through my baccalaureate in Europe. And I spoke three languages and then I decided that I would rather go and work in a studio than to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I did just that. I, worked, I went to work in a studio in New York immediately and learned a lot of trades. I learned lettering and airbrushing and composition and 
uh, illustration, and I learned the whole thing. Well. So um, my husband always was very amused because he has uh, many degrees, and he says my wife is a high school dropout, and I don't mind that at all. No, you have <laughs> great power of the of the English language. I'm very impressed. Well, thank you very much. It's not my native language, but um, I sure do uh, talk a lot. No, you speak very well. I'm never bored with what you have to say. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm glad you called. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. So um, you know how I probably shouldn't have admitted that in public, but. Maybe nobody else will tune in on this again. Maybe this show will go forever. Uh, by the wayside, nobody will ever hear it again. So anyway, here are my weeds that are growing on the um, on this fence. Makes for interest. It makes you uh, it makes you a little bit familiar with the place. You kind of know that uh, that these things happen out there, and um, uh, it makes also it uh, it also helps for what I call the anecdotal part. Of, uh, of these programs that you learn a great deal more than what you see by being in the environment and kind of feeling what's happening there. Uh, so here, here we go with the rest of this fence which uh, proceeds at a snail's pace. Actually, it's not that long, not that uh, long a period of time. What you have to make sure of is that the paint is of the right consistency. If it's too thick, it will not behave well, and if it's too thin, it'll run. So that probably is the thing that comes from experience. Um, also, the fact that I'm using this uh, Indian red uh, is a lethal color. It'll go anywhere and it stains anything. So I use it very sparingly, but in instances like this, it, um, its uh, properties are, are really uh, indispensable that they behave this way. Uh, what I'm using here is an extremely thin paint, uh, but the snow fence is, uh, is working its way to the east, I believe, and before time really runs out, this um, nice uh, grassy area in the front here uh, is um, got sort of an insinuation that uh, summer is coming to an end and that it's being uh, dried up a little bit. Uh, so the texture of the foreground is going to be important, and here I think this particular part of the program is going to illustrate to uh, Elaine um, that uh, the overlay is the technique, that, um, uh, that if I hadn't prepared that snow fence uh, against which to do this grass, it would be, uh, it would not have the same effect. Oh good, another call. Hello there, tell me your name. Hello, this is Anna. Yes, Anna. I was just wondering if they could expand your show for another half hour. I'm quite addicted to it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're just marvelous. Well, thank you. And very witty and intelligent. Well, gee, thanks. <laughs> uh, um, uh, programming is a problem. Uh, the, the pro I would love to have an hour and a half program. Oh, I would too. Uh, I would, <laughs> you know, I, I'm under tremendous time pressure here, and I try to get so much in in a very short period of time that I would like it very much. And, um, you know, you can't lose anything by asking. Uh -huh. So I just may ask the powers that be uh, if they would like to ever, for some special occasion, expand it to an hour and a half and see whether or not they die laughing. Oh, well, I will. I hope they do do it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they don't die okay. laughing. <laughs> good. Well, um, uh, I'm glad that you called. That's a, you know, it's a really good suggestion. Uh -huh. And, um, I would not. I would not uh, be uh, have a problem with that. It would be. Uh, it would be a sort of a marathon, uh -huh. uh, but worth it, I suppose. Oh, great! I'm so glad you called. Well, I hope I, I started something going. Or <laughs> the only way you do that is by saying exactly what you did to okay. call up and ask the question. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Call again. Okay. Bye bye. bye. All right, we're, I'm, I'm working towards the foreground because uh, the time, the clock, the hand of the clock and the painting of the picture uh, sort of seem to go together. The, the, the further towards the end of the hour the, 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 the clock goes, the closer I get to the bottom of the picture where I sign it. And on the stroke of nine, I expect to, to write my flourished handwriting and uh, sign off. So here in the foreground is the is the grass here. Five minutes? 
Oh, that's pretty good. Okay, uh, there's a young man that stands behind the camera in total darkness, and suddenly I see a hand come up with five fingers, and it says five minutes. So um, you now know the technique of this um, of this uh, program and how I keep uh, how I keep track or don't keep track of time. The um, I was saying about the texture in the foreground, where the grass has dried and uh, there are uh, visible spots of green, but for the most part, the end of the season is apparent and. Um, the, uh, those details are the ones that I think make a difference in uh, the school of realism. Uh, many times I have decided that being a realist is a bore and I'm going to go off and be an impressionist. And so I go out with a great pots of paint and I put huge uh, areas of plain color and I splash them across the canvas and I forget all the details and I come back and look at it uh, in my studio and I say, well, that really is terrible. That really looks horrible. So I'm not an impressionist. Uh, I am definitely a realist, but I also like to interpret at the same time, which may be somewhat contradictory, but um, and you know, what isn't contradictory? Uh, just about everything is. So, uh, combining uh, the, uh, the desire and the calling that I have to be a realist, I also kind of smack into um, uh, uh, interpretation. Another call. Okay, hello there. Hello, um, my name is Rob and I'm from Brentwood. Yes. And I have a question. I recently purchased a starter oil set. And yes. with the literature, it, it says that the golden rule of painting is the principle of fat over lean, but it doesn't elaborate, and I'm wondering if you could for me. Fat over lean. Oh, fat over lean. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. It sounds to me like you shouldn't put mayonnaise on the liverwurst. Oh. Uh, no, fat over lean. Uh, see, this thing here, this bottle of stuff that I'm showing you, uh -huh. is called archival fat medium. Fat has quotation marks around it. It means that it's oily. Some oil colors are less oily than others. Some are, have less oil in them. It's just that simple. And that's called lean. So actually, uh, I would take that brochure that c we got into the starter kit and put it on the bottom of the box and never look at it again. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> I think it'll just confuse the issue and it's going to get you to say, I can't start painting because I don't understand the difference between fat and lean. That's pretty much what it did. Well, don't let it because it's a lot of baloney. So I, I mean, it's okay. Paint. It's all right. It's a term that I only found out about it after, after I'd been painting 25 years. I, somebody said it to me and, and I looked totally blank and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. So it's not very important. I don't think it's important. I think what the important thing is to, is to observe, compare, and remember. Okay. And well, to get to work. Yeah, and I think I will. I, I, I agree with Anna when she said your show should be on longer, and it, it also should be listed in the local directories because it's very... Uh, I, I don't know when you're on anymore. I am always flipping to the channel. I wish I knew when you were on. Well, I believe that I'm on four times a week. Uh -huh. However, the times vary. Sometimes it's six in the evening, sometimes it's ten, sometimes it's... Yes. Eleven. I, I'm oh, not yeah. sure. Yeah, but you are on eleven o'clock on Thursdays. I was very surprised to see that. <laughs> well, I'm surprised too because I'm in bed at eleven. Yeah. It's only because of taping that I'm on. I certainly wouldn't be on live. Well, it's a fantastic show. It's very informative, very entertaining, and I love to watch you. Thank you very kindly. And uh, what did what did you say? I have to do what? Fourteen? What's fourteen? I, I I'm told that you have to do something about four. What does fourteen mean? Channel fourteen? Program guide. Program guide. Oh. Okay, have you heard? Did you get that? Yes, the program guide's on channel 14. Right. Yeah. Now there you have it. You see, we've <laughs> resolved everything with all this sort of extemporaneous talking to the cameraman. <laughs> well, well, a great show, Pat. Thank you so much for calling. Great work. And uh, get to work and forget about the fat and lean bit. I think bit. I will. I'll just burn it. How's that? <laughs> well, stick it on the bottom of the box in case you decide to show off in front of somebody someday and talk about it. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, well, maybe I will do a little bit of homework on myself one of these days and really find out uh, the times that I'm on, if that's possible, because I do know the program sometimes var programming varies uh, many times, and so it might be an arbitrary thing. Okay. Um,
I have a, a, the signal of one finger up saying one minute left, which means that this is snow fence, pa uh, snow, snow fence painting time or signature time. But anyway, I think you get the point. The snow fence is going to get done exactly the same way as it was done while I was talking to you. And um, the signature is going to be with this wonderful brush that I was telling you about. Uh, this time I think I'll just be perverse uh, because of all the compliments that I've just gotten and sign it down in the left side of the canvas with a wet brush full of very wet color and if you sign a painting on wet oils it will marry with the wet color and that means that nobody can wash it off it becomes a part of the painting if you allow a painting to dry and then sign it afterwards that is an overlay and it can be taken off which is why paintings are signed immediately in the wet color uh, which may or may not be of interest to anybody but it certainly is a curiosity and that is now part of the entire painting it can't be taken off if it is you'll get a hole in the in the color well so much for fascinating information and for something that everybody out there can use maybe not in any case thanks for watching i'm glad you watched and as my son says don't tell people i'll see you next week because they won't see you next week you'll see them or they'll see you or whatever in any case i'm um, I enjoyed doing this. I hope you enjoyed watching it. And whenever I'm on, try to catch it. Bye-bye.